Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Academics at Google. My name is Rebecca Moore, and I'm the lead for the Google Earth Engine and Earth Outreach projects. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Randy Sargent, whom I've known since 2005, when we worked together on publishing some innovative layers in Google Earth, which allowed people to fly in seconds from outer space to see the eyelashes on a camel. He's uh, currently holding dual appointments on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University and also here at Google. As a visiting scientist with my Google Earth Engine team, Randy's helping to research and develop time-lapse explorable maps, including a recently released time-lapse animation of the entire Earth from 1984 to 2012, which was mosaiced for more than two million Landsat satellite images. Um, this, earlier this year, Time Lapse won the People's Choice Webby for best use of moving images and video on the web. As a senior system scientist at CMU's Create Lab, Brandy researches for the Explorables project, developing ways to interactively explore and understand large data sets and complex systems, including air and water quality and employment and economic trends. Prior to CMU and Google, Randy helped develop planetary rover software at NASA and he, uh, he received his BS and MS from MIT. So, welcome, Randy. Thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca, and thanks so much for everyone being here. So most of what I'm going to talk about is the work of two different teams, the uh, Earth Engine team here at Google and also the uh, Explorables team at Carnegie Mellon University's uh, Create Lab. First I want to really dig into Earth Engine and, and get you motivated about why it's so cool and why it really motivated um, those of us at CMU to come here and, and work on this project. Um, Earth Engine, in a very, very short form, is what happens when you take all of the images that come from the many dozens of say, um, scientific spacecraft orbiting the planet, uh, run by the US government and other governments, take the data out of these sorts of archives, and put them into this sort of place, which is a Google data center, um, where we put um, all of the image data um, co-located with the CPUs to actually process that data. One of the earliest projects that the Earth Engine team undertook with the entire corpus of Landsat images that go back um, over 40 years now um, is can we build cloud-free mosaics of the entire planet? Now cloud-free mosaics in some places are easy, but this, this place in particular is in the middle of Brazil. It's a very, very um, rainy and cloudy place. Um, up until recently, the best you could do were pictures kind of like this. So now without the clouds. And here's all of South America. This is the best we could do prior to Earth Engine. This is painstakingly mosaicing kind of the best of all the Landsat scenes. But with Earth Engine, what we can do is statistically go through entire stacks of Landsat and find all the places around the clouds. So we can kind of combine different pieces of different scenes together and build a cloud-free mosaic of all of South America that looks like this. So one of the first deliverables, if you will, from Earth Engine was a new uh, cloud-free uh, base map that you see today in, in uh, Google Maps and Google Earth both. What else can you do with this entire petabyte scale archive of um, remote sensing data and images, um, what other sorts of analysis can you perform? Um, one of the, the early successes is um, this publication in Science. And with it comes a, the following data product, which is a map of forest change across the planet um, from um, 2000 into present day. And this is a map where we can zoom in all the way to 30 meters per pixel. So if we zoom in to the Amazon rainforest, for example, we'll see a lot of these red areas down below 
which are places where the forest has been going away. The bright green areas are places where the forest was there both at the beginning and also the end of the, the sequence. And you'll see some places in blue where forest actually reappeared. We can go around the entire, the entire planet this way. We can take a look at southeastern United States where you see a lot of red, you see a lot of blue, and then you see, so red and blue are places where the, the forest has gone and then come back. And purple actually is places where it's changed both directions. So these are places that are, that are heavily forested, but um, tend to grow back after, after cutting down. One of the really important things about taking this incredible archive of, of imagery and turning it into this product is we're turning data into knowledge. We're taking um, this stack of images and being able to prov prov provide um, analysis on top to be able to say things like the rate of deforestation over these 12 years in Brazil has been going down. So it's been decelerating. Whereas in Indonesia, the, uh, the rate of deforestation has been accelerating. So let me jump into what it's like to actually write some code inside Earth Engine. And I want to show you just a very short example, which is, which is one of my favorites. You may recognize this as lights at night. And if we go around the planet, you can see, um, yes, it looks like lights at night. Um, but if I bring up to layers, there are actually two different years here. So I can switch back and forth between showing 1992 and 2012. So we can zoom into Europe here and see the difference. And you see that, by and large, 2012 is brighter. But let's do a little bit of analysis on top of that. So let's switch. Let's add some more code. This is the code, what it looks like now. We're going to basically um, instantiate the collection of all of the lights at night's images. We're going to attach some timestamps to them. Then we're going to do a linear regression across every pixel in the map. So every pixel, we're going to look back to 1992 and through um, present day and make a linear fit. And then we're going to go um, add that to the map and visualize it. This is what we have. So let me try and explain what it is we're, we're looking at here. We're seeing lights at night. You can see where the, the lights are and where, where they're not. But the hue is now encoding whether the lights are increasing or decreasing. The red areas are areas of increase, and you can see a few places that are, that are very strong in the red. So up here we have like Poland, for example, or all of um, China, the southern part of India, lots of interesting places. Uh, places of blue are places where we're, we're decreasing the lights. And perhaps we can zoom in here to a, a really blue area. And if we turn it off for a moment, and you look, see here's, here's Poland. Um, let's, let's turn off and see where we are on the map. This is this big blue area. Um, it's been in the, in the news recently. So this is Ukraine. So Ukraine is in the middle of Poland, Romania, and Russia, which are all showing a lot of increase. This is right on the, right on the border. So lots of really interesting things you can, you can see in this map. I want to zoom into the United States. And you'll see places where there's a lot of growth around the urban areas. So for example, Dallas-Fort Worth area, we see a lot of red where the, the lights have been increasing. We've been you know, increasing the urbanization, uh, the urban footprint there. But in the Northeast, we see a lot of, a lot of bluer areas. And what's, what's going on there? Have we really been losing population? Only, only in a few places. For example, um, Pittsburgh lost a little bit of population during this time, but not, not a whole lot. Turns out what we're seeing here, by and large, is a side effect of energy efficiency and reduction of light pollution. So if you want to illuminate your streets and your, your highways, you want all the photons to be going down and not so much going up. So as we've been doing that more and more efficiently, you can see the evidence from space. Let me switch gears a bit. So I talked about, about Earth Engine and kind of what's, what's cool and how you can get involved like very, very quickly and, and do some interesting stuff. I want to switch gears and now talk about kind of the other team that, that's come together in this project. So the, C, the Carnegie Mellon Create Lab, uh, where I work, we do a lot of different sorts of projects, uh, mostly around empowerment of the public and communities, um, around technology, around data, around understanding. Rebecca alluded to the Explorables project 
Um, this is a project that we're working on to try to make, especially time series data, whether it's perhaps time series images of the planet or time series other sorts of things, um, explorable and more, more understandable. So when we got together um, and combined explorables with, with what Earth Engine was starting to put together, um, let me show you kind of what came out of that. I'm going to zoom out of this map and make it full screen here. <clears throat> you remember the, the cloud-free mosaic that was built out of all the, all the Landsat scenes? What we've done here in Earth Engine is build not one cloud-free mosaic, but 29 cloud-free mosaics. So now we have a, an animated um, map, if you will. We've, ta we've taken the 29 and we're playing through them, playing through them in a video. So we're kind of a normal Google Maps or Google Earth, you can zoom in and see something. Here we can zoom in and see it change. So let's zoom in, for example, to southwestern US. This is Las Vegas. So you can see over the 29 years here, Las Vegas is growing a lot. We can zoom in even further and see kind of it in great detail what's happening. We can see the, the suburbs forming and expanding outwards. We can see how the, you know, how the runways had to double up here in the, uh, the airport. We can also pan to the east and look at Lake Mead. So this is the side of the Hoover Dam. And at that same 29 years when Las Vegas is growing, Lake Mead is shrinking. So you can see this thing starts off as an island and is not an island by, by the end. So you can see in, in several different ways our footprint on the Earth here. Let's, uh, let's move um, down to South America where we were looking at some of the uh, deforestation analysis. Let's zoom in kind of as far as Landsat will let us go. We're in the Brazilian state of Rondonia. And I'm going to slow down the animation a little bit here. Let's go to super slow here. You'll see initially the roads all start to be built. And then around the roads, there are these farms. And understand that, that from left to right here, from east to west, we're talking about maybe 50 kilometers. So these are, these are big farms that are being cut out of the, the forest, primarily for soybean or for, for raising cattle. You can see a small, a small town is, is uh, forming in the middle of the, of the image here. Let's, uh, let's zoom out a bit. So now we're seeing maybe a quarter of the Brazilian state of Rondonia. I'm going to speed back up. And you can see this, this road stretch out and uh, how quickly this entire area kind of fills. You also see some, some interesting shapes appear. So now we're looking at the entire state of Rondonia. And you'll see these, these funny little cut out areas. And we're going to get back to those in a little while. Uh, because keep in mind that the deforestation is not happening everywhere, and it's happening in a lot of places. Let's zoom out even further. Now we can clearly see the Amazon River. Uh, we can see um, a lot of different things, but if you look along the southern extent of the Amazon, you see it retreating. And it's uh, the, the scale is, uh, the first time I saw this, I was, I was blown away because I, I didn't understand that you know, if you could look at it from space like this, um, you could still see it happening. It's, it's that, that big what's going on. So I'm going to zoom into another spot. So now we're at the, the, uh, the uh, uh, tributaries to the Amazon in Bolivia. And we're right off of the, the Andes Mountains. And here you see a different sort of thing happening. You see, watch the rivers go. So these are, these are called meanders and the river is meandering. And what that means is that as the sedimentation comes from the Andes and gets deposited, the river actually changes its banks. It moves to different places. And you'll see in places where the, uh, the rivers um, you know, loop back so far that they, they meet themselves and they end up orphaning these little ringed lakes that are called oxbow lakes. And if we follow this, we can follow this all the way to the Amazon and see um, this really impressive change happening. Move a little bit to the, to the west here and to the east in Bolivia and you'll see another spot and this is a spot 
where it's really quite complicated what's going on. So let me play it through a few times fast, and I'm going to slow it down a bit. So you see a lot of deforestation happening. You see a lot of, a lot of forest turning into farm. But this river is doing something kind of crazy. So the river is actually breaking free of its banks and going a different path. And then they get a third path over here. And if we slow it down even further, you'll see as it breaks free of its path, I'm going to pull back in time just a little bit. As it breaks to its new path, it actually floods this entire area. So this area, which had been farming, uh, basically got completely washed out. So we'll just wash again slowly. This is one of the things that, that rivers do in areas where they're depositing sedimentation over a large area. So they evolve and they switch between path and path, and they, they're basically just dumping, dumping uh, uh, sedimentation over this entire area over time. See the same thing like in, in river deltas. Let's look at some other things that the, that, uh, the, uh, the water is doing here. So we're going to go to Cape Cod. This is the south end of Cape Cod. Let's speed it back up. What you see here is the way that the, uh, the beach is changing over time. You'll see places where, where things break through. You'll see places where the, the beach is rebuilt. And you'll see that, by and large, most of the sand is moving towards the south. You can see similar sorts of things in the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Let's go zoom in there. Let's move to Iran, where we can see Lake Urmia. Lake Urmia is a, a very large lake, um, but it's been shrinking. And most of the water that, that has been historically going into the lake is now being diverted into these agricultural areas. So you can see, you know, first you notice that the lake is shrinking over these 29 years, but you can see these kind of green areas around on each side. And that, that's where the water has been going. As the water's been retreating, uh, the water becomes more salty. Um, you know, things like uh, fertilizer and pesticide concentrate. Um, so it becomes less and less uh, good water for using. So you actually have in the tributaries these sorts of uh, dams being built and new, new, uh, new lakes being formed to, to provide more clean water. And of course, that it diverts even more water from Lake Ermia. So Lake Ermia's days are, are numbered, I'm, I fear. Move over to Aral Sea. Aral Sea is the same sort of thing happening, but on a much larger scale. Uh, Lake Ermia is much, much larger. And Lake uh, Aral Sea is much larger than Lake Ermia. But the same thing's happening. So we have, if we zoom out a bit, we have these, uh, these agricultural areas where most of the water is being diverted. Let's zoom in a bit to one, one corner of the agriculture here. And this is a place where you sort of reach a peak of the irrigation. You can see initially this wasn't farmed. It sort of you know, spread out. I'm going to slow this down a bit. You see it turns green, but then it turns gray towards the end. So this is you know, tried to maybe overreach it a little bit here. Let's move to Saudi Arabia, um, another place where we're, we're irrigating in a, in a very dry area. Um, all the water for this center pivot irrigation is being taken from wells, um, from water that was, was put there you know, eons ago. So it's not, it's not being replaced very quickly. So this, this can't last for long. You can see kind of how, how crazy the extent of this is. Let's uh, move from, from water to fire. Um, let's move to Australia. <clears throat> if you look closely here, you'll see 
all these scars appear from, from burns. And it's like the, the areas actually become lighter when the underlying um, ground is shown after the, after the burn. Let me slow this down a bit. And you can see for each one of these fires kind of roughly where it started, what direction the wind was going, you kind of see the different, different paths here. Let's move to other, other disasters. Um, let's go to uh, Mount Pinatubo. So this is the, the caldera. And you can see, I'm going to just grab the slider here and move it all the way back and hit play. And you'll see as this appears, you'll see all the rivers of ash kind of going every which way from Mount Pinatubo. Let's move to, to glaciers, and we're going to go to Alaska here, to uh, Mendenhall Glacier. Now over, the, over these 29 years, we can see a lot of, a lot of glacial changes, a lot of evidence of, of climate change. So here, as we zoom in, you can see the, the front line of the, the glacier retreating slowly during the 29 years. Let me go back up here. Let's move to Columbia Glacier, also in Alaska. Columbia Glacier um, has an, a, a very impressive retreat. Um, it retreated um, tens of kilometers, starting from here and then all the way, all the way back. Now I'm going to speed this back up. It's a little harder to see when you speed up, but I want to show you another thing that's happening. So if we go to the glacial tributaries, if you will, these, these rivers of ice that are merging into Columbia Glacier. Watch closely and you will see how the ice is moving. You can see the motion of these rivers coming together and then draining out into the, out into the sea. Let's move to another glacier where that's even, even more obvious. This is Malaspina Glacier. There's not a lot of retreat happening here, but you can see kind of how the river, how the, how the ice is dumped towards the top and then moves slowly in these, in these waves out into, the, out into the ocean. We started with, with Las Vegas, but I'd like to show you some, some other cities now. This is Shanghai. And this area here is the where Shanghai proper was in 1984. And you can see as we go through our, our 29 years that by the end, it's kind of hard to tell where Shanghai ends and other things begun. The size of what we're looking at um, surely dwarfs uh, Las Vegas. You can see incredible amounts of land being added. You can zoom in here and, and watch. Let's move a bit south to the Pearl River Delta. Um, that's the site of a lot of electronics manufacture, and Hong Kong is, is right, right out here. And you can see over these 29 years, we go from a lot of farmland to huge urban expansion. Let's move to the to Dubai. Dubai is, is one of the most impressive sites of, of engineering, um, engineering new new land. So we can look at the islands being built here. Let's slow that one down up to you know, zoom in. These are the, the Palm Islands. They're two two sets. I'm gonna hit pause and just drag to the very end here. You can see both both and let's look up here to the north. These are the world islands. If you look closely, you can see how they map to the, the world. Can okay, move now to uh, the place where I grew up, Dallas-Fort Worth. 
Dallas Fort Worth has an incredible amount of sprawl. It's uh, uh, size-wise, it's growing quite uh, rapidly, but it's not not very dense population-wise. So here we have Dallas on the on the, the right and Fort Worth on the left. If we go up north, you'll see um, just incredible suburbification. Is that a word? Let's uh, pan to the west. And to the west here, if you look really closely, now we're, we're north of Fort Worth. In the last roughly five or six years of the animation, you'll see these kind of funny little white dots. And I'm not sure how many people are able to see the, the white dots from where you're, you're sitting. Those white dots are fracking. So those are actually pads where we're doing hydraulic fracturing uh, looking for, for oil. This is the, the Barnett Shale in Fort Worth. And it's both north and south of Fort Worth. So if you, if you look around, you'll, you'll find this stuff um, pretty much everywhere, including you know, right in the middle of, right in the middle of uh, urban areas. Let's move to Colorado. It's another, another site where there's a lot of hydraulic fracturing happening. So once again, you can see the pads appear. Here we also have to build the, the roads to get to the pads. Another type of resource extraction in West Virginia is mountaintop removal. So let's, let's take a pan over there and, and uh, start all the way zoomed down. So mountaintop removal is exactly what it sounds like. We're taking the tops of mountains, uh, removing them, putting them in the valleys, and all the, the land that we're moving, you know, we sift through it for, for coal, basically. Um, and you can see kind of how, how devastating this is to the, to, um, to the area. It's also fairly unsafe in terms of the water supply. You've, you've heard some, some fairly high profile problems um, with that. But let me zoom out a bit. And that thing we started off is just there. Now we're seeing kind of it's, it's everywhere. Zoom out some more. You can see it's the expanse of mountaintop removal. You know, we're not talking about 10 or even just 100 spots. We're talking about hundreds. Another type of resource extraction, this is also coal. Um, this is open pit. You can see as we're digging through looking for coal, we're taking what comes out and then putting it where, where the last pit was. So it kind of moves around almost like a, a video game. Let's move to Alberta, Canada, and look at some of the things happening around the tar sands. This is a huge facility. I don't know what all the different pieces are. Now you're looking at the tar sands, but if you look to the to the east here, you'll see, you'll see something that kind of catches your eye. So this is this is uh, logging. So we're we're um, cutting down trees here um, for the wood. And if you look closely, you'll see that it, they get cut down twice. Once right at the beginning, and once at the end. And if you watch it, you'll actually see that it's an alternating pattern. So the kind of the evens were cut at first, and the odds were cut later. Let's look at another place with some active logging. This is in Washington State. So we're seeing clear cut you know, in small patches. And then those slowly grow back and then get clear cut again. So I said that we we're gonna loop back to the Amazon and look at some of the some of the patterns of deforestation there. So let's, let's do that. You remember these shapes, as, especially if we zoom into to Rondonia here, these, these funny little places where people don't seem to be cutting down trees. Let's turn on 
part of the story here. This is the world database of protected areas. And in green we have kind of every region that's been recorded by Brazil as a protected area. Now different protected areas are, are different, but this one in particular belongs to a native people, the Suri, who uh, Rebecca and the Earth Outreach team have, have worked with uh, personally in, in Brazil. And you'll see that this is, this is territory that belongs to them that's been set aside by the Brazilian government. Um, it is illegal to shut down trees here. But you can see it happens anyway. You can see if we zoom in, um, people try to come in sometimes in the middle of the night and try to, to chop down some trees. Um, my understanding is that the, the peoples in this area have moved most of their population to the borders to try and prevent that. And so they're, they're trying to police their, their own borders and keep the illegal loggers out right now. To me, this, this shows like a, a very different story than the kind of depressing story that I, that I saw initially when I, when I first saw the deforestation. Um, and you can also start to see how it might be that Brazil is starting to decelerate its deforestation. I mean, in places, we're actually bumping right into the areas that have been set aside either for indigenous peoples or for, for other reasons. You can look around other spots, same story. Here we are in Pará, in this area that kind of sprouts out and almost like, you know, blooms like, a, like an evil flower here. Um, but it's basically steering clear of these protected areas. And we have this database now for the entire planet. So let's, uh, let's go take a look at, at other spots. If we go to, um, let's go to, uh, back to Washington State. We're gonna look at a reservation, um, Native American reservation in Washington State, the Kanawha Reservation. It's not protected nearly the same way as the Suri. You can't really tell the difference. Let's move to another spot in the U.S. This is a spot where policy changed um, partway through the animation. So look closely here. At the beginning, you'll see pretty much everything is being deforested equally between the left and the right. And towards the end, you'll see a border appear. It's a little hard to see. But the, to the right is actually the Clearwater National Forest. And by and large, forests are not protected from, from being chopped down. But sometimes there are different policies inside the national forest and outside. Let's move to Indonesia. We're going to zoom into Tessa Nilo, which was uh, made somewhat somewhat famous by the, the recent Showtime uh, climate change series. This is the protected area, and there's really, you can't really see the border at all. Like if we go to 2012, you can't really tell what's been protected and what hasn't been. So that's the end of, of the, the landscape. Let me, let me switch gears and, and move to some, some other some other things here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the new areas that we're, we're pushing on is um, what to do when you want to visualize large amounts of data that's not raster, that's not image based. And you'll see here we have like maybe three million different protected areas, but that, that's, that's kind of small. We're worried about like what about tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of, <coughs> of things which are not raster pixels. So you've probably seen things that look a little bit like this. Uh, up on the top or up on the bottom here, uh, or you've seen heat maps, which are, which are fairly low resolution. But I want to like call your attention back to the, the lights at night. And I want you to think about lights at night for a moment as, as something different. So it's, it's a, it is a raster product. It's come from a raster um, um, satellite. Uh, but think about it not as raster, but as a visualization, a really awesome visualization of a billion light sources or billions of light sources. And I think you'll, you'll agree, this is superior to any of the three things we just saw. Uh, so you're seeing an amazing amount of expressivity. You're seeing kind of quite clearly where the cities are. You're seeing kind of this, you know, this spider web of things that are joining the cities, the interstate highways and things of that nature. 
You can even see like around Chicago here, uh, this, this funny area where, where we start to, to color out into um, Lake Michigan. So this is actually um, yeah, an optical effect of, of normal camera systems. So you have when the light gets super, super bright, you know, the, the apparent image starts to bleed outwards. And there are a few different mechanisms of that. But the most, the most common is simply that when photons hit the lens, they may or may not scatter. Um, and you try and keep the lens you know, as clean as possible to keep that from happening too much. But when you have a lot of brightness in the middle, you start to see that. So for normal people, when they, when they look at this, they will tell you that that pixel here right, off of, right in the middle of Chicago is brighter than this pixel down here. But it turns out it's not actually true. Both are saturating the monitor. But you're, you're inferring from that, because we're talking the language of optics. You know, our eyes do the same thing. So we're, we're kind of born with this knowledge that this must have been brighter than, than this. Other things that you can really express well here um, are you know, things that are kind of jump out as surprises. So if you look here, you can see, you know, you have Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul. You have this weird thing over here. And even if you didn't know enough geography to know that there's not really a city there, it doesn't look right. You know, it doesn't look the same as the other cities. So you might think, well, why don't we zoom in here? And you look a little closer and you say, what the, what's going on here? You see all these strange horizontal uh, bands and you wonder, what, what does that mean? You know, is that, the first time I saw it, I thought it was an artifact. I thought it was an error of the satellite. But we'll, we'll get back to that. Sorry. So I want to show you the, the first visualization we built, kind of using that as an inspiration. So I'm going to uh, stop the animation and go straight to the end. And this is animation. This is a, um, a visualization of, of about uh, 20 million well pads um, from uh, drilling for oil and gas. And this is in Pennsylvania. We can zoom out and take a look at other places. And we're kind of doing the same sort of trick where if there are a lot of them together, we start to make them brighter, and then we start to make them bleed out. So it kind of transitions from individual points you might see into a heat map kind of on the, on the fly, if you will. As we zoom in here and uh, grab the animation slide and we, we go through just the past few years, you'll see all the fracking that's happening in Pennsylvania. So the, these horizontal bands over here are all, all uh, fracking. We can go back to Dallas-Fort Worth. And we can look at what was going on with all these strange lights up in North Dakota. And it turns out if you look closely, I'll switch to map, that's a little easier to see. Sure enough, all these wells were being drilled in these horizontal bands. Like, what's up with that? So you zoom in a bit more, and you see these are all on the roads. And even in places where you don't see the road, it's just because our, our map's not quite up to date yet. So these are also places where we're, we're uh, fracking. Uh, North Dakota is unusual because we're fracking for oil rather than gas. And we're just throwing away the gas that comes out. So a third of the carbon that comes out of the ground from North Dakota um, from, uh, is, uh, is burned. So it's, it's being, it's being uh, sent straight into the atmosphere. Let's keep moving on. So what if we have a lot of vector data that we can animate? What we're looking at here is, is fires uh, from space. And you watch closely and you'll see different sorts of things happening, right? You see, like, if we zoom into Africa, you'll see a, a year's worth of fire that we're, we're cycling through. You'll see fires up here in the, the north of the equator and to the south of the equator. Let's turn on satellite, and you can kind of see in the middle we have, like, this really dense forest. But these are agricultural areas up in the north and up in the south. And this is a form of agriculture called Swidden agriculture. So it's, uh, this is, these are fires being set by people. We can look over here in, uh, uh, between India and Nepal and see kind of every year it kind of marches up from Southeast Asia up here with the seasons. So you do this kind of once a year to prepare the, prepare the ground for the, the next year's growing. You can also see other sorts of things. So you can see things that are not changing so much over time. You see these very bright areas. And you see that a lot of them in the Middle East, and you can imagine what they are. So these are all. Uh, flaring from from uh, from oil uh, oil wells. 
so we can zoom in here and actually see on the satellite kind of what, what it must look like on the ground. And you can see these things on fire, these very dirty fires in this particular spot. And once again, we have this, this amazing flaring happening in North Dakota. We have a, two other places happening in, in Texas uh, where there's a lot of flaring. But curiously, there isn't much flaring around Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, because it's so close to people, they, they actually um, spend the extra to collect everything and, and not burn it. What if we combine that visualization of fires with a satellite map that also can animate over the, the course of a year? Let me show you the same spot in Africa. So unlike the, the earlier animation that we saw was built from Landsat, this is built from MODIS. And it's, a, it's still a, a prototype right now. But what we can see is the seasonality of the brown and the green in this area and kind of how in phase the uh, fires are with it. We can do the same thing up here. So with that, let me, let me loop back and go to my, my last slide here. So looping back to, to time lapse and kind of the experience we had um, putting this together with the, the Earth Engine team, um, the success we had with, with uh, Time Magazine, um, it, it really brings home to me you know, the reasons we did this, the reasons we, we, we you know, decided to do this together and kind of all the amazing things that, that kind of I observed you know, working with the Earth Engine team uh, is an incredible group of really talented and capable people. Um, and we couple that with Google's infrastructure and ability to scale computation and ability to take the results that we built and get them out to the world. Um, as Rebecca said, the, the Landsat um, time lapse project uh, won a Webby with uh, Time Magazine. And we've, we've had many millions of people come visit. But I want you to kind of like really meditate on some of these numbers that I'm, I'm showing you here up on the slide. Um, this is the amount of computation. Um, that we found kind of lying around to, uh, to, build, um, to build those entire you know, 29 mosaics and build the, the videos around them. And I, I, think, I think it wouldn't surprise you to say that I, I couldn't find this lying around CMU. So this, this is, I, th I think this it brought home kind of in many different dimensions you know, why it was important to work together and kind of how, how blessed I feel um, to, to be part of this, this, uh, this effort. Thank you. Any questions? Yes? So 2 million hours of computation, is that what uh, scale of core? It's a, yeah, two, 2 million core hours, so, so yeah. Other questions? Jeff? It's, it's nice to see, and it's kind of startling just to see what's happening with the Earth, but it's nice to see the optimistic of the tribe that was out there sort of protecting their, their land and their forest. Do you expect to find more things like that? Or yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's worth actually spending hours looking at Brazil. Brazil is doing a really good job of this. And, and it really becomes obvious why the deforestation is slowing down, because really they're, they're, hitting, they're hitting the wall in a lot of places. Um, that's not true everywhere. But it, but it, it shows that when we decide to, to set a policy for, for good reasons, um, you know, things can change. You know, we, we have control. It's not, it's not this inexorable, you know, progression until all the trees are gone. Have, have you seen instances of governments actually use this, these really powerful visual, visualizations for, uh, for actual policy making? It's, the question is, have, have we seen places where, where the governments are, are using this? And, and it's starting to happen. I mean, so we're, we're starting to see in places um, that people are, are starting to you know, actually, actually look at this. I know that, that here in the, in the US, um, this has gone to you know, congressional um, subcommittees. And uh, I, I, think, I think that we're going to see more and more of that, of that happening. Yes? 
So the, I, th I think you're, you're asking kind of how, how many people are, are looking at it, like how is it being used? Or? It's, it's a really good question. I mean, and we're, and we're you know, Earth Engine is a complicated thing, so, so we've been focusing on the, on the time lapse for the last little bit here. Um, Earth Engine itself, in terms of, mm -hmm. of researchers using the platform to do analysis based on kind of this, this incredible archive of of images connected to all the computation, um, the usage looks a little, little bit like a hockey stick right now. So we're seeing more and more people. So you saw that the, the initial science publication um, led by, by Matt Hansen and a group of people actually here, here at Google. Um, you're seeing you know, many, many people kind of following in, in those sort of footprints. So you're seeing kind of an explosion of analytical results and I hope an explosion in kind of visual results as well so that we can reach out not only to, to researchers, but also to policymakers and to, uh, to the public altogether. Yes? Are all the web apps that you showed publicly accessible? Um, everything I showed you is publicly accessible with the exception of the World Database of Protected Areas. The, the, uh, everything else I showed you was, was public. Is that, is that connected somehow? Uh, we, we just haven't we haven't gotten to the point where where we have a public version of that. What about when you were doing uh, math on the on the white data? Was that running in the browser? The uh, the math being done kind of on, on the fly um, when we were when we were doing kind of the linear regression on the lights um, that's being done on the server side. So you can potentially have very very complicated. Um, that was accessing maybe maybe 30 images over a, over a sequence of years. Uh, sometimes you'll be doing image, you know, calculations over maybe a stack of 500 or 1,000 or more. So it really needs to happen in the cloud. And then that's, that computation is basically being um, done on, on demand. So you don't do it for the whole planet, you do it for the part that you're looking at in the map. And as you zoom in, each tile is being built on the, on the fly. Other question? Will you be updating this data uh, over, over time? Will we be updating the data over time? Yes. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, thank you, everyone. Oh, oh sorry. Yes? Um, it's okay. like, are you planning to, in the future, take like, the fracking example of all the fracking that's occurring across the US? The, the question is, what, what are sort of value add products that can be done on top of the, the fracking data? Like if we know where all the wells are being drawn, drilled, what can you compute from that? And that's an area where, where Earth Engine is now like branching out into. Um, it's very, very strong in the raster um, computation now. Um, but Earth Engine is starting to build analytical tools to be able to answer exactly that, to be able to answer things like, um, you know, what is the rate of change of you know, the, the drilling wells, you know, what, what sort of impact might they have, you know, let's intersect that with local populations, you know, with, that are downwind and things of that nature. So the, those are the sorts of things being added to Earth Engine right now. Thanks.